Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel series featuring life sciences. I'm your host for today, Lisa Hickerson. I'm the business development manager for our New York office with Turner Construction. Uh, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. So today we have a, an hour packed. We have a lot of great content to go through. Um, if we could talk for hours and hours, I'm sure we could. But it's no secret that there's been a tremendous focus and attention on life sciences here in New York and across the country that has sparked a tremendous amount of discussion. So today we're actually going to give you a, a two-parter um, focusing on life sciences in the, the Northeast Corridor, New York, Philly, and Boston. So our first segment, we're going to give you a brief market outlook from our Turner Construction folks. And then we're going to follow up by a panel discussion from some of our industry leaders with Q&A. So if everybody is familiar with Zoom at this point, a year in, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there is a Q&A feature. So please feel free to type in any questions throughout the discussion, and then we'll field as many of them as we can at the end. And if not, we promise we will follow up with you. So I think with that being said, I'd love to invite my fellow market outlookers uh, to join. So today we have Greg Smith, our VP and Precon Manager from our Turner Philly office. He's gonna give us a national overview we have George Goggin, our VP of Development from our Boston office, Dave Kaminsky from Philly, our VP and GM in our Philly office, and I will be rounding it out with the New York Market Outlook. So with that, Greg, take it away. Thank you. Here is the National Market Outlook in three minutes or less. So here's the US dollar flowing across Turner City in 2020. And 2020 was obviously a strange year for that US dollar where we've actually posted a decrease in our Turner Building Cost Index, uh, the first one in about 10 years. So let's look at that one construction dollar a little more closely, uh, material overhead and profit and labor. That's what makes up a total construction price. And historically, we see that moving across the horizon at an escalation rate of about four to 5%, one and a quarter point per quarter. That's what we typically see historically. But I want to dig into a little bit of the components that make up that dollar. So if labor were to increase $1 across time and overhead and profit and material stayed flat, we would experience a 1% increase in the construction price. And uh, that's historically what we see, 3 to 4% increase in labor cost, especially in cities that are predominantly union. That's an easy calculation to make. Material, on the other hand, though the data is readily available, uh, material lately has become very volatile. And the biggest problem currently with material is the supply chain, getting the material to the job sites. And I'm sure that all of you have witnessed extended lead times, delays in shipments, and all kinds of problems related to getting materials on site. So supply is the problem in the current market for materials, and that's causing an increase in price. And then a giant freighter gets stuck in the Suez Canal which makes supply chain even more difficult currently. But um, looking at the first quarter of this year, things didn't look very good. Uh, all of the primary inputs to construction from copper to steel scrap have all spiked in the past quarter. And if that spike were to continue, that 5% material increase could actually go to 10% and the construction price would go from two and a half, two and a quarter percent increase to four and a half percent increase just by a fluctuation in material because it's 45% of that one construction dollar. But looking at overhead and profit, that is really the throttle for construction price. Depending on your market and the city where you work, if you have uh, available labor, then it's less impacted with uh, booms in work or shortages in, in labor. But the, a 10% swing in overhead and profit impacts the construction price by 2%. That's the throttle of the construction price when materials continue to increase and labor historically increases. And one commercial for CMs, when those of you that select and evaluate CMs, I wanted to point out that a 1% variance in a CM's overhead and profit has a 0.2% difference in the construction price you pay. So my advice is choose wisely because that qualified CM can return that investment tenfold if you hire the right one. A little commercial there. So in a boom market, this is what happens. Material goes up, 
Labor is rare, so you pay a premium for labor. And uh, trade contractors have the ability to increase their overhead and profit. That's what we saw in 2005, 2006, when we had crazy spikes in escalation. And if you looked at the, the data, you would say that, well, that's where we were headed in first quarter because material was going nuts and uh, labor was continually increasing. And uh, ENR expected that we were going to see a huge spike in price, but we didn't. That's what's unique about the current situation we're in. The throttle kicked in and subcontractors, trade contractors discounted their bids. They absorbed their labor increases. They absorbed the material increases because you see in the top chart, they needed work. They needed backlog because of the delays and cancellations that happened due to COVID-19 the past year. They needed to build, restore their backlog. And that's exactly what they did. So across the country, we saw the price to remain flat, even though we knew the inputs are continually going up. So what does that look like now? Uh, we expect that overhead and profit will level out because you can see moving into first quarter, the backlog has been restored. There's no reason for subcontractors or trade contractors to discount their overhead and profit. So expect that to remain flat. We know labor continues at a three to 4% increase over time that contributes 1% to the overall price and material. We expect to get better, but not right away. The supply chain is going to remain a, a, a problem for materials which are going to drive up the price. So that could contribute 2% to it. So the forecast for escalation moving forward, I would expect nationally to be two and a half to three and a half percent across the board. Again, subject to the individual conditions in your city. Thanks for the opportunity. You can contact me on the bottom of the screen here, or if you have specific information or request about the Turner Building Cost Index, you can reach out to me or Attilio Rivetti and, and help. I would love to explain it further. Thank you for your time, and I uh, hope you enjoy the series today. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, my name again is George Gaughan, working here in Turner's Boston office. So the Boston market uh, in 2020 was down between 14 and 19%. This is measured on the volume of new project starts per annual. The previous uh, red hot residential market was virtually non-existent in 2020. Markets that are normally a mainstay for us here in Boston, which are higher education and healthcare were flat or paused. And what was previously a hot commercial and office market was also virtually paused with high uh, sublease vacancies. So this took the overheated market, actually very similar to what Greg described, the overheated market of 2019, where we had construction escalation at five and a half to six and a half percent, and took it all the way down to having negative construction escalation in the second and third quarters of 2020. So what happened since then? Since then is largely related to the topic on this phone call, which is the life science market in Boston. It has been booming and creating new opportunities in construction as of late. These are in traditional spots such as Kendall or the Seaport, Alewife to the suburbs, or new spots developing in Somerville or in Alston Brighton. So this combined with some of the material increases that Greg talked about that are happening globally and nationally, looks at us calling escalation right now between one and 2%. Truly, depending on what happens in the life science market here, with ground up and renovation starts, this escalation could over the course of 2021 increase to over 2% heading toward 3%. That's where we currently are in Boston. I pass it to Dave in Philadelphia. Thanks, George. So good afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Dave Kaminsky and I'm the general manager for Turner in Philadelphia. So when you look at the Philadelphia market, we were on a nice steady uphill climb in regards to construction growth from 2016 to 2019, with uh, commercial, residential, healthcare, and higher ed really leading the way in those sectors. And there was no reason to think that uh, 2020 would be any different. So Philadelphia also had the number one jump nationally of any city in college graduate retention rates during that time. So there was many more college students graduating in the city 
and staying in the city to work, which is what you want to see in a growing city. Um, however, we all know what happened in 2020. And as a result, the Philadelphia market also felt that same impact as our market was down roughly 15% last year. So for Philadelphia, for, for Philadelphia, you can look at 2020 and I like to look at it in three different categories, kind of like a traffic light. You got the red light or the market segments that pretty much stopped were commercial office, TI, retail and entertainment. The yellow light, the middle light or uh, the segments that slowed down a little bit that traditionally were hot were higher ed, healthcare and residential. And then finally the green light or the segments that continued to move forward and maintain momentum in 2020. And as we see now in 2021, were manufacturing and life sciences, especially when you start to see the clusters forming in Philadelphia on the life science sector, you know, in University U City Square, the Navy Yard and uh, Discovery Labs. So looking forward in 2021, we've already seen a positive bounce from 2020 and expect the market to recover roughly 12 to 15% and continue to follow the uphill trend uh, we're seeing in AIA billings index. Now, when you look at labor escalation and productivity in Philadelphia, the key lies in concrete, curtain wall, and MEP, MEP trades. In a, in a hot market like it was in 2019, and hopefully where we, where we look to be again at the end of 2021, this is where we see most of the volatility and the price escalation in the submarket. So we believe it should remain relatively flat, you know, the, these next couple quarters in 2021, but we're going to see, start to see a little local escalation start increasing around 2% by 2022. So that's Philly in, in two minutes. I'll hand it back over to uh, Lisa from New York. Mute, Lisa. Lisa, you're on mute. Might be a good time for a commercial break, Greg. Right? Back to your commercial. <laughs> The other thing we're learning in 2020 is technology is obviously. Sure. Whoop. Sorry, guys. My computer decided to glitch on me. I apologize for that. But we rebound quick here in New York, just like the market in 2021. So there you go. everything's going to go well. So I'm going to do the sans notes. I'm at my, my co-host desk here. Um, so in 2020, uh, we did see the market drop dramatically here in New York. It was about a 30% drop, which was um, a big hit. Our largest sectors here with commercial healthcare and higher ed almost coming to a complete freeze. So realistically, when we're looking into 2021, we are very hopeful that those markets are gonna start rebounding with the release of some public funds while the healthcare and the higher ed markets are starting to generate some of their capital plans as they go into the summer after they made it through the downturn of the first COVID pandemic semesters in school. So it's really important to, you know, keep in mind that you know, we are seeing an increase in the AIA billings in the Northeast, which is great. Um, we're starting to feel it now as we go into the second quarter of 2021. Um, the life sciences market, similar to this, which again, why we're having the discussion, has been booming for quite some time in New York. It has, it has put a, a huge spotlight on it in 2020, and now even more so in 2021. And there's millions of square feet coming on board between Deerfield and the 57th Street Project, Inno Labs with the new Alexandria Tower. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity here. We're seeing a lot of commercial um, interest in conversions to life sciences with the commercial space being converted. Big influx of industrial, huge input with the uh, aviation market. So we're seeing a, a big increase. We're hoping that 2021 is gonna at least see a 20% rebound in the market, um, which is very hopeful. And then just on the, the labor front, you know, with the trades and what we're seeing, we're in line with what Greg is saying. I think it'll be flat escalation through the end of the year, but expecting a two to 3% increase um, in escalation, you know, starting at the end of 2021 going into 22. Um, trade contractors are still hungry for that backlog. 
If you're putting a new building in, I would recommend it here in New York because the excavation and the concrete trades are, are very, very hungry. So with that being said, that wraps up the market outlook. Um, so I wanna thank my, my fellow market outlookers here. Um, if you guys uh, will then join me back at Q&A, um, but I'd love to invite the panelists to join us on screen. Excellent. So for our panel discussion today, we have a, a sampling across the, the Northeast here. I'd like to welcome Chris Senzak. He's the principal of Jacobs, part of their laboratory planning group. Um, Bill Kane, president of East Coast and UK markets for Biomed Realty. Douglas McGorman, from the executive director um, of engineering and facilities at Century Therapeutics. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Nancy Kelly, president and CEO of Nancy J. Kelly and Associates. And I will now love to turn it over to my friend and our moderator for today, Mr. Rich Alvarez, VP and Construction Exec for Turner here in New York. Good afternoon, everyone. Really excited for this topic. Um, we have a great panel today, so I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Uh, just to remind everyone, if anyone does have any questions, please, please be sure to use the Q&A function in the chat, and we'll be sure to get to those at the, uh, the latter part of this portion. So let's jump right into it. Uh, Bill. Good to see you. Uh, the big question we're seeing around the country is whether developers are building ground up construction versus that of conversions. What do you believe is driving this based on your development model? Thanks, Rich. Thanks for the opportunity to participate today. Um, uh, before I start, I just wanna say, usually when I'm on a panel like this, I usually steal ideas from Nancy Kelly and I obviously can't do that being on the same panel as her. So I'm gonna do my best thinking on my own here. Um, but just, just thinking about uh, ground up versus uh, uh, conversions, there's uh, obviously a lot of activity we're seeing in the market. I think what we do is we pretty much, uh, first of all, focus on the fundamentals in the industry when we think about this. We're seeing uh, not only just a, a greater demand for therapies as the aging population starts to play a stronger role in uh, the industry, we're seeing more capital we're seeing more uh, demand for spaces from new companies that are evolving from that capital. And we're naturally, we're seeing an imbalance of supply and demand that is forcing some companies to actually forward lease or store space for the, for the future. Um, and conversions and ground up naturally play two very different roles in that arena. Um, for us, we're running a 13 million square foot portfolio of tenants. And we're looking at this from a market perspective, but we're also looking at it from an in-house perspective. We have in-house demand that these tenants require from us. Um, most are credit worthy, healthy, uh, big bio, big pharma or institutional that have upwards pressure uh, where they need to grow or spin off or have a partner move in. And the way we think about it is um, ground up is naturally uh, a really good approach to uh, designing and programming a building that meets the standards that our uh, Biomed believes in, in terms of optionality and capacity and operational resilience. Um, we're naturally building in a number of uh, core locations where, we're, where we have a high concentration of tenants and buildings. We're working with ten, uh, Turner out in San Francisco. We have a couple new uh, buildings slated for uh, Cambridge, Somerville and Boston. And uh, we're looking at a few options. We have some underway in Cambridge, UK. Um, those are longer term um, supply uh, ads to our portfolio. And they're really designed for those um, tenants that are getting to a point where they're ready to commercialize. They can commit to a product on a longer term basis. And they have uh, very specialized needs that a new type of construction uh, uh, building has. Uh, the last thing I'd say is conversions, I think, are playing a very, very strong role today as the pace of this business picks up. Um, the, the, it's implying new demands for companies to deploy technology and move into space faster. And it's naturally uh, put pressure on existing office buildings to convert and provide a product in a shorter time frame. So um, lastly, I would just say, um, we find the conversion opportunities very, very interesting. We're involved in several in Boston now, several throughout our portfolio. Uh, we're very careful about the conversions that we, that we pick to do. Not all office buildings are capable of handling the robust infrastructure and capacity that these tenants need. But we find it as a real good alternative to ground up construction just to keep 
uh, companies in Boston, companies in Cambridge, rather than losing them to other regions, and also to allow our companies or our tenants to move move in faster. So it's kind of like we're we're looking at it through both lens, and we're 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 very supportive of both both models. Awesome, awesome. And following up on that concept of new versus conversion, sustainability and reduction of our carbon footprint is taking center stage in, in many market segments. Nancy, how are we seeing the impact in the life science sector and what can we expect to see from this? Yeah, so obviously these buildings require a lot of energy um, to, you know, because of the mechanical systems, the investment in them and to run and operate. Uh, so they really do um, require special attention to sustainability and how we're going to reduce costs. Um, this is not only around energy consumption, but it's also about air quality, biodiversity, uh, using data to measure what's going on in a building and to improve you know, employee experience. In energy conservation, I think you're gonna see um, an increasing emphasis on cogeneration, renewable forms of energy, high performance facades, and uh, low embodied carbon construction, um, especially for ground up uh, developments. But I also think it's really important to remember that sustainability isn't just about energy. Um, you know, I've got these five pillars of wellness that I use to talk about sustainability. The first is economic growth, um, the economic impact and job creation that a project is going to have. Obviously, the environmental sustainability that I just talked about is extremely important. Um, health and wellness of the people that live and work inside those buildings, uh, social equity and diversity. And finally, uh, the innovation community that's created. And you know, when you're thinking about conversion versus ground up, whether you have a, a campus-like setting where you have more than one building or whether you have a single building that's being converted, you need to pay attention to creating an innovation community. Um, it's not just about the building, it's really about the culture and environment that you're creating within the space. And that's an important part of uh, wellness and sustainability. Great. Chris, how do you see this impact into design? Well, I think, you know, it goes into planning some of those amenities, right? Um, so Nancy just talked about it a little bit. I mean, looking at some of the amenities, not just cafes, which are pretty typical, but looking at like childcare, um, outdoor space, um, you know, again, just about the wellness, you know, we, we talk about it as quality of work life, which is really important, creating a hub that people want to go and work at, I think is really, really important. Great. And Bill, just based on just following up on that same topic, uh, how do you see this impacting you know, your development model? Well, I, I think um, the broader impact to the development model um, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, we, this is something that most of us already know has been underway for quite some time. Uh, life science buildings have a uh, really robust way of um, uh, serving their tenants. There's a high degree of diversity that's required. So when you're planning um, a, uh, a capacity that was required by a Merck or a Pfizer or an Illumina, all of whom are, are tenants of ours, we're building in a high degree of capacity, but they have very sophisticated needs in terms of energy efficiency and sustainability. Uh, they're following ESG reporting requirements. They have very sophisticated teams that demand a high level of performance from us. So we have a whole set of engineers that um, routinely review uh, not only the systems that we're putting in place to look for upgrades, but uh, what I found to be one of the most exciting parts of this is we're reviewing operational and user behavior. And we're delivering that data to the actual users that are leaving sashes up um, with fume hoods or leaving lights on in rooms or just running equipment over the weekend, over the night. And the, the interesting thing we found is that most of the users are competitive in that uh, they want to do a better job than the next bench over. So I've seen one example where iPads are placed bench to bench and different benches, uh, different users at benches were competing as to who could get their graph uh, lower in terms of uh, 
uh, utility capacity and utility use. So it's, it's, it's something that's already underway. We're excited about the enthusiasm, not only through the technology that's coming to the market, but the users who want to participate and also the investors that are demanding this level of performance with uh, the money they're putting into the, uh, the industry. Yeah, this is Doug McGorman. I just wanted to add one thing in, in about the, um, the way you're building out facilities, be, be a ground up or renovation. And that is, I've worked for several bio startups in the last several years, and it's cheaper, better, quicker. It's time to the market. So they will choose the renovation over the out of the ground, usually first. But what I caution everybody on is picking the right building for that renovation. We've been involved with a few lately that are just very old office buildings where utility infrastructure is lacking, floor loading is lacking. So you're going to end up paying some premium costs just to bring the building up so it's usable for the life science community. Great. Thank you. Chris, you and I have been, I guess, doing labs now for close to 20 years, believe it or not. And I know that you're involved in uh, planning various types of lab spaces all around the country. What trends are you seeing in space planning? Where are design trending and what should developers be focusing on for their spaces? Well, we touched on a number of things already, um, but um, you know, in no particular order, uh, some of the things that we're seeing is, one is uh, preparing for flexibility and adaptability. That remains to be pretty consistent and an important aspect. Um, so looking at the building from a structural uh, perspective, looking at the structural uh, bays, um, standing that so that it can accommodate multiple types and use of uh, tenants um, is something to really consider. Um, <clears throat> there's also been an increase in the need for computational space um, in, in these lab buildings that we're seeing. Although, you know, once again, you know, there is that, that discussion about post COVID and, and the need for more lab space and, and remote working and so forth. I've had a number of conversations with multiple clients and I think that's an ongoing discussion about um, computational space on site or remote. Um, I know clients are doing uh, different things. Some have different perspectives on that. And I think it really depends on the type of work and science that, that people are doing. Um, the other things are planning for single and multiple tenants on, on a floor, um, being able to accommodate them, not just for their research and office space, but also being able to provide some, some identity to each of those tenants um, and, and providing uh, amenities for those tenants. The biggest thing is looking at technology platforms. So vivarium, biocontainment, clean rooms, that comes up. You know, looking, how do you plan for something tomorrow, today, right? Um, so a lot of these developer buildings start off as a core and shell and, and determining what needs to go into those day one versus day two. And one of the areas that is um, showing a lot of uh, attention is ultra low vibration space. You know, there's been a lot of um, a lot of technology improvements in imaging, cryo EM, and that seems to be an area that um, a lot of our clients are interested in. So, looking at that's really important. Um, and then office to life science conversion, we talked about that. That that seems to be a, a big topic of discussion today. So, those are some of the the trends we're seeing. Doug, are you seeing anything similar? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, I'm usually working directly with, with the pharma company. And again, if the project takes longer than a year, they're, they're asking why. So we, in the past several projects we've done, we've gone from a paper napkin design to a fully commissioned and qualified facility in under a year. And if you would have said that five years ago, you would have said that's impossible. But when you put the right teams together, you, you can pull off some of these miracles. Um, I think biopharmers are coming up uh, every day and they're all looking to get their product into clinical trials and then hopefully commercial someday as quickly as possible. So we have to be able to respond quickly and provide them what they need. The other thing that you have to be aware of is that you can finish the design, you can finish the construction. And by the time the paint's dry, the scientist is probably changed what they're working on and need something different. You're going to rearrange your room. You've got to build flexibility into the space. 
And the product they're working on one day, if it fails in clinical trials, the other product they're gonna make may require completely different manufacturing equipment. So you've got to build flexibility into these spaces right out of the gate. Seems like a fast timeline, like a key to success. Uh, Bill, can you elaborate a little on this? Uh, I think I think we're finding a general theme just based on what I'm hearing in this panel, the need for speed. Um, and we work on that a lot. We study it a lot. Uh, we point to what's happening in the industry. There's some, some pretty remarkable trends happening, which is deriving this. And that's, we, we look for the cause and effect here. And it's, from what I can tell, it's really based on the uh, improvements in technology. You know, all these genome-based applications, messenger RNA, RNA interference, CRISPR-Cas9. I mean, there are remarkable, um, uh, there's remarkable progress happening. And it's, it's good for patients, it's good for investors, it's good for the general industry. And what it's generally doing is allowing uh, our tenants, our clients to build therapies in a more precise way, a faster way, in a highly more efficient way. Now, uh, that may be good for uh, patients and investors, but you know, ultimately we're trying to make bricks and mortar move faster, okay? Um, so the way we see it is for us to compete and to enable our consumers to compete, we need to create a, a, a platform that cultivates a, um, a life science arena that can move and adapt faster. And we do this by uh, clustering our buildings in uh, core market locations that have great proximity to academia or big pharma, or big bio, lots of talent, lots of capital, lots of ideas, and lots of events. Um, we're, we're enabling uh, some of our tenants to build platform technologies uh, by helping them adapt some of their spaces so they can use a platform to deploy technologies faster uh, and more efficiently. And then uh, we're also building more flexibility in the spaces. The obvious approach to flexibility is uh, movable benches and equipment. The not so obvious part of flexibility is building infrastructure and uh, mechanical systems that can toggle from one use to the other without retrofitting uh, the entire penthouse or moving shafts or, or core parts of the building. Um, and then the other not so obvious approach we do is we offer um, other spaces. So we're in the business of providing other spaces for our tenants. I mentioned that in-house demand. And ultimately, if we're balancing flexible spaces, optionality in the buildings and alternatives for them to move into, we're allowing them to move quicker. And the, the last thing I'd say is when we look at the cost of real estate, you know, historically it's been like ranked seventh or eighth in the cost of operating a lab facility. So paying rent or paying a premium to be in a core market is not as much of an impact to them when you compare to the benefits of uh, being in an, in, an, in an environment that allows you to perform faster, uh, collaborate with your peers, borrow equipment and people, and just optimize in a, in a networked way, uh, uh, the ideal way to, to get a targeted therapy to a data point that, that's financeable or, or uh, uh, impactful for, for your approvals. So I think this is one of the biggest things that we're working on. It's one of the most important things that we should all be focused on is how, how to, in order to maintain our, our, our positions in New York and Philly and Boston and all the other markets, it's, it's, we have to maintain that adaptability uh, as, the, as the industry moves uh, so quickly. Yes. And, and I would add that, that um, you know, all of that discussion was really around companies that are developing therapeutics. But a large portion of the life science industry today um, is made up of uh, different kinds of companies that are being driven by technological change. So for example, instead of just reading a genome today, scientists are writing a genome. And what this is opening up new markets for biology in agriculture, new materials, energy, it's called synthetic biology. It's probably the fastest growing segment of, um, of life sciences right now. And then with cell and gene therapy, you've seen you know, huge emphasis on biomanufacturing because those facilities need to be close by um, to where the patients are uh, you know, being treated. Um, and so that requires a whole new, you know, type of facility. 
and proximity. Well, and we'll stay on the topic of forecast and uh, based on what we heard from our from our Outlook folks in the beginning, Nancy, um, we saw that venture capital spending in the U.S. related to life science shot up 30 billion in 2020, which is over 40 percent that from 2019. Do you think this is an anomaly, or will we continue to see investment being made in this sector? No, I don't think it's an anomaly. I think that um, we have entered into the century of biology, and just as chemistry drove the the 19th century and physics drove the 20th century, biology is driving the 21st century. Um, and we are going to continue to see investment in this area. 75% of that venture capital investment that you just talked about went to Boston, California, and New York, by the way. Um, and those markets are really growing. If you look at where companies are talking about putting their dollars, R&D prioritization is still um, a major focus as is collaboration with pharma and other companies. Um, and the key factors that are driving this haven't changed, they've only accelerated. And that is previous biotech investments have proved extremely successful. Um, as Bill said, the, uh, you know, we've got an aging population with chronic healthcare needs that requires new types of therapeutics. Um, you've got innovations in technology, as I just talked about. Uh, and all of this is, is really driving the market forward right now, especially for diagnostics, treatments uh, and therapies in COVID-19 and, and cell and gene therapy. And staying on that topic, Doug, what do you see for the future of biopharma? Uh, I hate to keep going back to speed, but I think the future of biopharma is when, when bio uh, biology type products started coming out of the, the pharmaceutical companies, the therapy costs at the end of the day were, were really high. So a lot of the products that I'm starting to see go into clinical trials are going to reduce that cost of that therapy down significantly. But I think uh, biopharma is going to keep evolving. I mean, it, like, like Nancy said, it is the, it's here. It's the wave of the future. It's just going to continue to grow. So we have to be able to build out space quickly for them to uh, step up and then start to do their work. Because typically, uh, a biopharma startup is usually started off by a scientist. They know nothing about the facility, how to build it, how to run it. Uh, so that's where we have to step in and, and help them out and get them to the marketplace quicker. Believe it or not, we've gone pretty far into this. I was, um, we wanted to leave some time for a Q&A. So before we do that, I'd love to get your final thoughts uh, on what we will see next in this industry sector. Uh, if we can begin with Chris, please. So repeat that question, Rich. I, I, you came in. Sure. Uh, your, your final thoughts on what we will see next in the in this uh, industry sector. Well, I think you know, as Nancy said, I think synthetic biology is is going to increase. I think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, you know, we are seeing from our side, we're seeing a lot of movement in New York City for life science projects. Um, so as as our firm has been involved in, in many, many projects, both here in um, New York, as well as on the West Coast. Um, once again, I think, you know, technology is driving a lot of these, these projects. Um, you know, technology platforms, again, imaging is, is something that um, we're seeing on every single project, um, preparing for that. And the, the requirement for some of this imaging, um, modalities is is extremely stringent. So there's a lot of design and structure and, and, and uh, analytics going into that type of space. So it's highly specialized space. Thank you. Uh, Bill? So I guess what I see today is um, one year into a pandemic that has exposed the entire world to the inner workings of this industry and demonstrated how it can uh, treat our families, improve our well being, maybe even save our global economy. So I see a higher level of awareness and appreciation for the industry. Science is now cool, I've heard some people say. Even the biology part, Nancy, that is now the century theme. 
um, I see uh, more capital going into it as a result of that, uh, more capital allocations into the industry itself. Um, I see the technologies that everybody talked about improving the efficiency and the speed. And I see more people gravitating to it, more companies, more vendors, more, more partners. Um, so I just see, um, and I also see personally, a, a greater emphasis on clustering for all those reasons to move more efficiently and, and work together, find arenas where you can work together to optimize the resources and knowledge that you have to get from A to B. So considering all that, I see more companies moving into Boston and Cambridge and New York and Philly and all the rest that we determine or consider to be a core market or a cluster market. My prediction is that there's going to be more demand and more companies uh, demanding more from us, more buildings, more materials, more spaces, more land um, in these locations. It's, it's, just a, it's, it's just the supply chain of pushing people, technology, and capital into it, what we've seen in the last two or three years. It's only going to spit out more companies and more opportunities for all of us to work on. Great. Uh, Doug? I think the days of uh, running projects where they're plan and spec are going to fade out to the past. And I think design build or design assist is going to be how you're going to run the projects moving forward so you can so you can shorten the schedule. And uh, some people believe design build is more expensive. I don't, proven it several times. I think we have to be able to start turning space around very rapidly. And I think the other thing that's going to happen is people are going to, developers, investors are going to start to buy up buildings and create space where a bio a uh, tech startup can come to them and say, I need 10,000 square feet of lab and maybe a little clean room here and there. I think they're going to have to come up with a modular approach so they can get these people into operation very quickly. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, so I, I agree with everyone. This is a really exciting time for life sciences for all the reasons that everyone has said. And I think that um, you're going to continue to see the growth of clusters, as Bill alluded to. Um, and you may even see some shifts amongst those clusters. You know, Boston and, and California have been always kind of in the lead with San Francisco and San Diego and now LA. Um, but I think you're going to see New York, the greater New York metropolitan area and New Jersey emerge as a powerhouse. And I would say the, that combined market is the strongest and largest market in the country right now. It's also, uh, the best kept secret. So um, we're changing that. I think that there are other exciting opportunities that are coming down the line with new federal investment. So there's some pending bipartisan pieces of legislation like the Endless Frontier Act, which would reorganize the National Science Foundation and invest a billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars uh, across the country in frontier technologies, including life sciences. And 10 billion of that would go into regional centers of excellence, uh, 10 regional centers of excellence of which um, New York, New Jersey could be one. And there are other pieces like the Innovating, uh, Innovation Communities Act, which would invest $80 billion um, in leading MSAs across the country. So these are all going to be opportunities that um, are going to help to fuel the growth of the private investment in the company formation that we've just talked about. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the good thing is, is there's a lot of questions coming through, as you can imagine. There's a lot of people that are really interested in this topic and want to know what's going on. And I'd like to jump into the Q&A section. Uh, Chris, first question. Uh, do you see an increase of hygienic wall cladding systems being specified as opposed to epoxy paint, for example, being used within life science and pharma, especially due to COVID-19? So there's been a lot of conversation about it on projects. Um, I would say that there hasn't been much implementation of like uh, the, that type of wall system, like Arcoplast is one manufacturer, um, but there's been a lot of conversation and particularly it has not been around the, the, the discussion about COVID it's been really about the type of space and, and operational maintenance and cost. Um, I think that there's still a huge gap between conventional materials and this, this FRP or um, hygienic material that 
clients tend to um, tend not to go to um, because you know the thing is there are different people making different decisions on projects as we all know. There's the end user and then there's the the person that writes the check and sometimes those two don't necessarily agree. Um, but yeah, I mean we're still seeing it once again in high um, containment areas or high areas of which are high moisture or water like age wash, vivarium type of facilities. Uh, Bill, a question came through regarding uh, labs being built in residential neighborhoods. Are they, are they looking at that area? Are labs being built in these residential neighborhoods based on what we discussed earlier today? Well, there's, there's naturally pressure uh, from areas that abut residential neighborhoods. Um, but more often than not, um, residential neighborhoods don't always provide what lab users are looking for and lab users don't always provide what residential neighborhoods are looking for. So my short answer is not really. Um, labs like to uh, cluster in commercial environments that have tech, um, other like users, and, um, and there's also, uh, you know, some loading and utility and operational uh, components of a lab building that are a little heavy for a, for a residential neighborhood. Um, so their mixed use uh, um, developments when they're planned the right way are perfect for a lab development. And you don't wanna necessarily just position all lab buildings in a kind of a, 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 a commercial arena only. Um, so I guess my answer is yes for mixed use environments that are planned well and no for very well established residential only neighborhoods. That's the shorter answer on that. Uh, and Doug, uh, do you see uh, biomanu biomanufacturing facilities being constructed near the largest cities moving forward? And if not, where do you see them being built? Well, interestingly enough, the last three that I've been involved with were not near big cities, but they did pay attention to where the labor pools were coming from. They, would, they wanted to build around colleges, universities. They wanted to make sure they were close to hospitals. Um, and and it can, for, for the clients that I have been working with, it comes down to cost per square foot on the real estate market. The closer you get to the bigger cities, usually the higher the dollars per, per square foot of rent. So we're building them out in the, the middle of New Jersey sometimes where the, the rent's cheap, but then you may take a hit on trying to get people to come there and work. So, and, and you know, back to that residential question real, real quick is I've done a couple facilities in residential neighborhoods and the key to, to that is communication with the neighbors, invite them in, go, go sit with the planning board, have a chat with them because they're scared of you. But if you explain to them what, they're do, what you're doing, uh, you can win them over and you can be good neighbors. And while we're on that, with the demise of conventional retail shopping centers, malls, and outlets, what's the feasibility of those being converted to labs? I think the, the outlook is very good and I'll, it's gonna sound like a strange reason, but usually they're slab on grade. <laughs> and typically when you're building out labs and, and clean room manufacturing, you need a, a, a foundation for the equipment because some of it's very heavy. They have liquid nitrogen freezers that are 5,000 pounds and four square feet. So I actually see that as a viable option. And uh, needless to say, the parking would be great. Let me say that again. Uh, Nancy, do you see a change in, in the layout for new labs or offices spaces being built or remodeled post COVID? I know we touched upon COVID a second ago. Did you see a reduction in headcount per square foot? And does this affect the cost per square foot? I think it really depends on the science that um, that companies are are doing. You know, I mean, Chris alluded to this when he was talking about the percentage of space allocated to labs versus computers. Um, increasingly, you know, it really does depend if you're doing a lot of work in silico on computer before you test it in lab in the laboratory, which happens in synthetic biology a lot. You know, I think that um, you probably will see a reduction in the number of employees per square foot. Um, and, in, and people being more flexible in terms of timing, how their schedules are rotating, uh, 
things like that. Um, but remember that even in the midst of COVID, uh, labs needed to be up and running and people, this was an essential industry and people were coming to work. And so the incubators and laboratories that were operating in New York never closed. And in fact, most of those companies ended up growing, raising substantial amounts of funding and hiring during the pandemic. So um, I don't think traditional wisdom can be used to measure what's gonna happen in the life science industry. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you touched upon uh, ultra low vibration a second ago. Uh, is this in specific floors or specific parts of the floor plate or across the board? Uh, also, what do you see as being ultra low? So uh, once again, I, when we're talking about ultra low vibration, I think we, we uh, immediately focus on the lowest level of, of any building. So slab on grade um, would be the area. And, and that could be, you know, depending on the, the science and, and the need, it could be a por portion, portion of the floor. It could be an entire floor, um, depends on, once again, the program. And, you know, in terms of low, ultra low vibration and the types of equipment, again, the biggest thing is, is cryo EM. So, you know, for most of my career, a lot of the imaging facilities that I've been involved in, um, the criteria has probably gone as far as uh, BCE. We, we are involved in projects now that are, are stretching that to BCF, BCG, extreme low vibration spaces. That um, is just incredible, just the amount of design and, and, and computational work that has to go into the, to, to make sure that you're achieving that. Because we know that in an urban environment, we've got a lot of these sort of uh, peripheral uh, things that are happening that are intermittent that could um, potentially uh, compromise and, and introduce vibration, unwanted vibration into these facilities. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, what I'm seeing. We spoke a lot about speed to market. Um, Bill, are you seeing any prefab or offsite methods being applied to life science construction? Uh, not outside of uh, fairly complicated mechanical systems that are better assembled and prefabbed to, as far as they can be in a controlled environment. Um, it's an interesting notion I've heard brought up in several meetings by several different people. Uh, and I assume you mean in the truly modular sense of prefabbing actual units of the building. Um, I'm very curious about it um, as it, it could alleviate uh, speed or even uh, enable some temporary locations to be used when certain markets need it the most. Uh, but I, I still have a lot of questions with regards to uh, some of the heavier components of a lab building relating to uh, chemicals and safety and loading. Um, so I think it's a great conversation to have and start. I just haven't seen it develop yet. Nancy, I know you mentioned the, the federal funding a little while ago and we spoke about New York and New Jersey. Uh, what about New Jersey, both from the suburban and cities like Jersey City? What do you think about those areas? I think Jersey City is an extremely interesting location. And I think you're gonna see some significant announcements being made in the very near future there. Um, 2020 was a really interesting year for life sciences in Jersey City. Uh, there's actually a budding cluster that's growing there. Five companies uh, located there or grew their facilities, including a um, 100,000 square foot uh, lease that a uh, Merck affiliate took. It was office space, not lab. But you're seeing more and more life science companies show interest in Jersey City. And it really is the gateway between Manhattan, where the largest concentration of academic medical centers in the world are located and New, the rest of New Jersey where the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world are located. What's also interesting about Jersey City is it's an urban environment. Um, it does have the space that you could do a mixed use facility like what Bill was, was talking about to create a live work play environment that doesn't exist in the New York metropolitan area right now. And it's also interesting in that it sits in the heart of the East Coast Life Science Corridor. 
from Boston uh, to New York, New Jersey, Philly, Mid-Atlantic, North Carolina. And you can be uh, at the World Trade Center in 10 minutes on the path and up to Grand Central or Penn Station and to Boston or North Carolina, you know, in 20 minutes. So it's a very, very interesting uh, location for life sciences. Hey, Nancy, um, I think you mentioned before that there's some interesting things going on in Westchester County too in New York. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so um, obviously Regeneron is building a completely new campus up there, uh, which is going to, I think, more than double its footprint. Um, but in addition to that, you know, the Westchester County has committed to building a major life science park up there, uh, you know, which is still under design and consideration and planning, but um, it's moving forward. They have um, the Westchester Biotech Hub, which is promoting um, new events and partnerships up there. And so there's a lot going on. And I think that, um, you know, there are some interim uh, kind of clusters developing between Manhattan and Westchester County, which could provide a jumping off point for more development up there. Yeah, great. This was a phenomenal panel. Thank you, everybody. I learned a lot, so I appreciate it. I'm back at my desk, the computer's working, all is right in the world. Um, Richie, thank you for, for moderating. Nancy, Bill, Doug, Chris, always a pleasure. Thank you very thank you. much. Uh, so you. we will be sending out a survey afterwards. We appreciate everybody's attendance today and the time they spent with us. There's definitely gonna be more to follow, a lot more conversations on life sciences. Um, we are going to distribute the recording for this uh, at the end of the week. So thank you again. Have a wonderful week, everybody, and stay safe. Science is cool. Love yeah, it. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.